Hello and thanks for joining us on Encore. Coming up in today's show, the man who sold his art. David Bowie's collection of modern and contemporary pieces are being auctioned following his death in January. Experts say this spectacular selection shows that he had as much of an eye for art as an ear for music. Washington welcomes a new museum dedicated to African-American culture and history. And we delve into the life and work of the artist behind Belgium's best-loved boy reporter, Tintin. Cartoonist Hergé is the focus of a new show at the Grand Palais here in Paris. He's best known for his music, but David Bowie was also a visual artist and an avid collector of other people's work. Highlights from his collection of contemporary art have now gone on show in New York. Some 350 of the pieces are to be sold in London in November. Sotheby's is handling the collection and has put a low estimate of between 11 and 17 million euros on the lot. Alexander Orcott has this report. A final look at the art collection of one of the most iconic figures of the 20th century. David Bowie never stopped pushing the musical envelope from the 1970s all the way through to his death in January. And he sought inspiration from the works that surrounded him. It's more to do with his wider interest in creativity in the way that artists work, in artistic process. Um, he refers to one of the paintings in the sale, um, the Head of Gerdeburn by Frank Arbach, that he'd look at it in the morning and it would affect his mood and also that he'd be inspired to try and make sounds um, that reflected the way that painting made him feel. More than 350 pieces will be divided into three sales. A wholesale of postmodern Italian design and two sales of modern and contemporary art. The late rock legend was deeply engaged in the world of art from all over the world. Modern British art in particular. British art of the 20th century, outside just a few artists, is relatively unknown by the wider international art community. And it's great. Um, I always say to people that it's a really cool thing to collect. And here we are with possibly the coolest guy of the 20th century collecting it. The most expensive work on sale is Jean-Michel Basquiat's Air Power, with an estimated value of three to four million euros. The pieces have been valued as works in their own right, without taking into account any Bowie effect that may boost the price still. After the pieces leave New York, the auction will open in London on November the 10th. We're moving to a much bigger collection now, the first national museum documenting African-American history and culture. It was inaugurated last weekend in Washington, D.C. by President Barack Obama. He was joined by his predecessor, George W. Bush, who authorized the construction of the building. The museum's opening comes against a backdrop of mounting racial tension in the U.S. Phoebe Lanza Wood takes us on a tour of the premises. I am the greatest. From Muhammad Ali's gloves to Chuck Berry's Cadillac, rusted shackles to the timbers of sunken slave ships, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture offers a whirlwind tour of the USA's black roots. This is not a story of black people by black people, but that rather this says the way to think about America is through the lens of this community. So if you want to understand American notions of optimism or resiliency or equality, it's tied to this community. Visitors are taken on a journey from slavery and emancipation through the civil rights movement to today. Many of the 36,000 items on display were family heirlooms, including the dress worn by Marian Anderson for her historic performance in front of an integrated audience in 1939. The museum celebrates political activists, movie stars and athletes alike for their contributions to the land of the free. How have African Americans used sports to fight for greater rights and freedoms? What I try to do is twofold. I try to celebrate African American athletic accomplishment, but also situate it in larger political and social contexts. 
It's a project that was first conceived a hundred years ago, commissioned by George Bush, and has come full circle after being inaugurated by the US's first black president. Barack Obama said the museum would document stories overlooked in history books and that its impact would go beyond the African-American community. His iconic line drawings have become an integral part of children's literature around the world, bringing to life characters like Captain Haddock, the Thompson Twins and, of course, Tintin. Hergé's graphic novels have been translated into over 100 languages and still sell in their millions every year. Now, a new show at the Grand Palais here in Paris takes us through the life and work of Georges Remy, better known as Hergé. I went to check it out with Jérôme Vassilakos. <laughs> Remy, or even Tintin, just who was the man behind these personas and was he one and the same? Just like his creation, Belgium's most famous boy reporter, I'm here at Paris's Grand Palais to investigate. Adventures of Tintin originated as a comic strip in the Belgian newspaper supplement Le Petit Vingtième in 1929. Hergé was influenced by the American cartoons of the time, especially the speech bubbles. Years later, he'd develop his own style known as La Ligne Claire, a single stark black outline. Johan de Moor was part of the team in Hergé's studio. I once drew some rocks and the horizon and the sea. Then I traced a straight line on the horizon with a black fountain pen. And Hergé came, the little blighter, and said, I'd prefer you did that by hand. The style is weirdly simple, but in fact it requires lots of work. It's easier to be complicated. <laughs> Along with success, Hergé ran into controversy early on in his career. He was accused of collaborating during the Second World War and of associating with Nazi sympathizers. His critics say there's evidence of racism in his early comics. Tintin may have traveled the world with wide-eyed curiosity, but the 1976 Tintin and the Picaros saw the artist accused of weighing in on dictatorial regimes. Mais dans la dernière histoire, si on m'a critiqué, je crois qu'on a mal compris. J'ai simplement voulu montrer, au-delà d'une histoire qui est une histoire d'amitié, en quelque sorte, j'ai voulu montrer comme arrière-plan, comme arrière-plan, que toute dictature, quelle qu'elle soit, qu'elle soit de gauche ou qu'elle soit de droite, est haïssable. C'est tout. And despite his great success, Hergé encountered problems with accusations of racism and colonialism. How did you encounter these accusations when dealing with his body of work? This is all the career of an artist who was born in 1907 in Belgium. Belgium at that time was a colonial uh, empire, uh, like France, like uh, UK. So we have to read to the, uh, the Tintins uh, especially the early Tintins of the 1930s, uh, with uh, this knowledge uh, of the context. Experts say that the publication of The Blue Lotus in 1936 marked a turning point in Hergé's approach to comics. Can you explain that a bit more? For the first time, he will have this so important encounter with his friend, Chinese friend, Chang, and the young Chang will uh, teach him a lot of Chinese culture. Uh, also, he will study very carefully uh, the, the art, the traditional art, of the drawings, uh, uh, Chinese drawings.
The show takes in important pieces from Algiers' archive, including early sketches of characters like Tintin, Captain Haddock and the Thompson Twins. There's also examples of his work as a graphic designer and pieces from his personal art collection, as well as the letters, photos and interviews that start to unravel the mystery of Algiers. finishing with some contemporary art courtesy of the Tate Britain in London. The gallery is showing the work of the Turner Prize finalists. Awarded to a British artist under 50, the prize is among the most prestigious accolades in the art world. This year's entries range from giant sculptures depicting human body parts to a mini mountain of money. We'll leave you with some of the highlights. Remember to check out our website. We're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.